Financial Solutions Certification course. I hope everyone had a wonderful day. And this evening we are going to be picking up with our review in the parenting manual. So if you have your books, we're going to be starting on page 39. Page 39. And this is lesson five that we are reviewing. Effective parents have self-control. And we know that self-control is one of the most important positive character traits to develop. It's the foundation of all positive moral character. But it's also one of the hardest traits to acquire. But that doesn't mean that it's impossible. We can acquire it through consistently practicing it. Okay, so on page 39, where it says, additional steps to developing self-control. We're going to look at those steps under there, okay? So the first one says, first, acknowledge that there are triggers in your life that you have a difficult time dealing with appropriately. These triggers could be taking instructions from someone in authority or dealing with a disobedient child. Whatever has the potential to cause you to lose your self-control can be a trigger. Okay, and remember on page 38, under the overall picture, we have the definition of triggers that you want to, that you want to highlight, which just going over that, it's triggers are incidents that bring out specific responses from us. Okay, so that's, what, that's the definition of a trigger. And we all have something that triggers us, something that pushes our buttons. So the first step, like it said here, is acknowledging what those different things are, really looking at ourselves and figuring them out. Step number two, prepare yourself for the fact that triggers can surface unexpectedly. In fact, another name for triggers is tests, okay? And, you know, this can kind of be the same thing with emotions. They can be very unexpected. So it kind of goes hand in hand here. It says often the situations that test us can catch us off guard. But remember, our triggers or tests, when handled appropriately, help develop moral values. So handle them with self-control. Positive character is developed by consistently choosing to do, by constantly choosing to do what is right when faced with situations. Step number three. Have a plan to handle your triggers appropriately when they arise. You want to remain as calm as possible so that you can think morally and do not respond impulsively or emotionally. And this brought to mind the character unit, page 80, setting your mind in advance. We have to mentally prepare ourselves for how we're going to deal with these situations and how we're going to deal with our emotions. Having a plan and rehearsing it in your mind will greatly increase your rate of success. And step number four here, use the STOP acronym. And we're going to go into the STOP acronym here on the next page. Use the STOP acronym to help you make moral, responsible decisions that demonstrate your self-control. It works for all ages. Okay, and that's... That's an important statement right there. It works for all ages. No matter how young or old you are, the STOP acronym can work for you. So let's turn over to page 40 and go over exactly what the STOP acronym is. And this is a very important page for us to know for the test. Okay, page 40 goes over the STOP acronym. So with, along with um, page 25, if you just turn over there real quick, Page 25 was also another important page number that we wanted to remember for the test as well. And that page talks about um, an effective parent takes on the role of a teacher, provider, and a disciplinarian. So page 25, and now we're going to, also we want to remember page 40. So the STOP acronym. At the top we have it, STOP, THINK, OPTIONS, AND PROCEED. And when this is put, into practice, it, it is very effective. Okay, jumping down to the second paragraph under the heading, take it one step at a time. 
that second paragraph. It says, we have to learn to make moral choices. This is what you're going to highlight. We have to learn to make moral choices from the beginning of a problem rather than after losing self-control. We need to learn to practice insight and foresight. Insight is knowing what the heart of the matter is, what you are dealing with. In other words, you are able to look past irrelevant information and focus on what is really important. Foresight is the ability to anticipate the outcome of a situation based on present facts. Once again, educating ourselves instead of, to, instead of jumping to a conclusion in a situation. Okay, so the purpose of the STOP acronym is to be able to gain control of ourselves before we deal with a situation and, you know, help someone else gain their control. Okay, we don't want to have any regrets later and by practicing the self-control will help us not to have any regrets because we will know we have effectively dealt with the situation. On page 41 under the box there you're going to highlight the first sentence in that paragraph starting with developing self-control and practicing it diligently in every aspect of your life will not occur overnight. And I want to reference here in the self-control unit, page four. Developing self-control is a long-term process. That's in the self-control unit on page four. Okay, so you're going to highlight that first sentence there on page 41. And then it says, it takes time effort and energy to learn new ways to handle your emotions and then to act in a controlled fashion. Although success may be difficult at first, do not give up. And I have that underlined and highlighted. Do not give up. We have to be willing to put in the hard work if we want to see results. If a situation arises where you fail to follow through on your plan, take an object take an objective look at your actions and evaluate your behavior. What did I do wrong? What did you do right? Once you have evaluated your choice, your actions, determine in advance not to make the same wrong decision, decision if a similar situation occurs. Rehearse your plan or make a different plan for the next time you are faced with that trigger. And don't stop trying until you have achieved your goal of consistently using self-control in every aspect of your life. Okay, so most importantly, never give up. If, say for instance, you wanna learn how to play an instrument. You know, in order for you to become really great at it, it takes consistently doing it over and over and over again. And yes, you're gonna mess up here and there, you're gonna make mistakes, but you learn from those mistakes and you keep practicing and you put every effort you got into it and pretty soon you'll be able to play that instrument perfectly without any mistakes. So it's the same thing with developing self-control. The more you do it, the easier it will become. Okay, that completes lesson five and now we're gonna go into lesson six. Effective parents teach self-control to their children. And on page 43 is where we're gonna start with our highlight. Under the heading, it's never too early or too late to start. And one question that many people ask is actually right here. It's this sentence, this um, top part that I just read. They say, you know, is it too late to start teaching the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program? And the answer is no. It is never too late. Anyone can learn the program no matter how old or young they are. You know, the Peaceful Solution instructors have taught this program in juvenile halls and prisons and they've turned many people's lives around just from them simply you know learning these concepts and choosing to do them and make the right choices they've been able to turn their lives around and get back on track so it's never it's never too late and as we learned in the beginning of the book you know it's great to start even before the child is born. If you have that opportunity, start when they're in the womb, going over these concepts in them. And that, you know, helps to start build, building that positive character within them before they are born. So you're going to highlight this first paragraph here. It says, 
Whether you have a child who is an infant, six years old, or 16 years old, one of the most effective ways to start teaching self-control is by first role modeling appropriate behavior and then implementing rules and guidelines in regards to proper conduct. It is up to you to know what behaviors you want from your child, to verbalize the rules that govern those specific behaviors, and to consistently guide, discipline, and instruct your child through rep repetition. Okay, remember, like we just went over on the previous page, never give up. And it might take time, it's going to take time before you start to see change or maybe the results you're looking for, but your consistency is going to pay off. Turning over to page 45, page 45 and under the heading, think about it, halfway down the page. You're going to highlight these first four sentences. Children who, wa who watch TV excessively can become withdrawn. Their ability to communicate and socialize with other family members and peers can be affected. When you interact with your child, you become a part of your child's life. You share conversations and learn about life together. It takes planning ahead to accomplish this. And you can end your highlight there. Okay, and then also going down on page 45, under the heading, The Importance of Rules in Developing Self-Control. And you're going to highlight this first sentence. As your child matures, consistently evaluate his or her behavior and determine which rules and guidelines will help to develop proper conduct and social skills. Okay, so turning over to page 47... We have the heading, A Few Rules About Developing Rules. Okay, so rules are very important that they came up with rules for developing rules. So this is important for us to know as well. And to keep in mind that the reason rules are implemented is to help mold and shape the individual. And as we've learned in, you know, the kindergarten series of The Peaceful Solution that, you know, rules keep us safe. Okay, so here we're going to keep in mind these points here that are on page 47. The first one is make sure that rules are thoroughly considered and evaluated before they are implemented in order to avoid confusing the child. When rules are not clear, not only are children confused, they are more apt to resist them. Okay, so we want to make sure that they have a clear understanding of what the rules are. Number two, keep the rules positive and focused on the desired behavior you want from your child. For example, instead of do not shout, you could say speak with a quiet voice. So we're reinforcing that positive behavior, reinforce the parts that, you know, what you want that child, what you want to stick in that child's mind. Number three, keep rules simple. They are easier for children to remember as opposed to no running in the house, you could break a vase, fall or get hurt, simply say, walk in the house. It is uncomplicated and easy for children to remember. Number four, be careful not to present too many rules at once. Work on one or two key behaviors at a time, then gradually add more rules as circumstances demand. And after a while, when these children are practicing these rules, it's going to become a habit for them. And it's something, you know, they might not even look at it as a rule anymore because they're going to be so used to just doing this behavior. And number five, do not expect your child to remember or embrace the rules immediately. Constant reminders and consistency on the part of the parents are absolutely necessary. So we can't just, you know, make the rules and say, okay, here they are and think your job is done. No. We have to cons consistently make sure that they're being practiced by our children. And that helps us to see, you know, what points or what things we might need to work on with them as well. Turning over to page 48, we have effective communication. So under the heading effective communication, you're going to highlight these first two sentences. Communication skills are essential or very important to positive parenting. 
A moral person will take the time to respectfully listen to what the child has to say. And then here, we're going to keep in mind these tips. Use the following list to help improve your communication with your child. So we have the do's here. State the problem in a calm but firm voice. Use correct language as opposed to baby talk and speak slowly. Kneel, stoop, or bend down to your younger child's level and implement the spoon technique, which we're going to go over on page 49. And the do nots. Do not name call, accuse, argue with, or put your child down. Do not curse at or around your child. You would not want him to repeat the curse words. And do not yell at your child. Otherwise, he may begin yelling at you and or his teachers. Okay, on page 49, we have the spoon technique. Okay, and you can highlight that at the top, the spoon technique. And this is a great technique that we went over. It's great to familiarize yourself with this technique. And most, you know, this technique is very effective when it's used correctly, just like the STOP acronym is also very effective. And, you know, we went over that it doesn't have to be a spoon that you use. One teacher said you could use a microphone. You know, you can use, you can be creative with it and make it enjoyable, but it's really a learning experience for the children to, you know, have, take their, take their turns speaking and also listening to what the other people have to say. Okay, so that completes lesson six. And now we're gonna turn over to lesson seven which is teaching anger management. And if you turn over to page 52, page 52, under the article here that says, um, does kindergarten need cop? So under that article, you're gonna highlight this first sentence. One of the first and most effective ways to assist young children in learning to control anger is through role modeling, is through role modeling of proper anger management skills. Okay, so this goes back to using the stop, STOP acronym. We must be in control of ourselves before we can help control someone else or control before we can help a child to calm themselves down and control their emotions. And children are going to look to our example. So whatever they see the parents doing or the teachers doing, you know, the saying goes, actions speak louder than words. So you might tell them, okay, you know, no yelling, but if you start yelling at them, well, that's what's going to go into their mind. And they're going to think that, well, it's okay to yell because they saw their parents doing it. Okay, on page 53, we're going to go um, halfway down, and you're going to highlight this first sentence where it says, in addition to watching TV. So you're going to highlight this first sentence. In addition to watching TV, how we handle our anger in front of our children can be equally as damaging. Okay, so just, you know, how we see all these things, these violent acts on TV, how a parent or a teacher handles their anger in front of their child can be just as damaging to them. It says, how do you behave when your, ch when your children do not act the way you want them to? When a car cuts you off or you have misplaced something you need, do you or others in your household rant, rave, scream, curse, slam objects, and bang doors? If these behaviors are displayed in the presence of your children, they are learning from you and others around them. Poor co poor coping skills and a lifetime of poor anger management skills. And, you know, I've heard some people say before, well, I do these things when no one's around, so it doesn't matter. My children aren't seeing it, but what you practice doing when no one is around, that's going to become a habit. And then eventually those actions are going to come out at the wrong time in front of your children or in front of someone else's children or your students. They're eventually going to come out. So we don't want to practice dealing with our anger in the wrong way. We want to always practice dealing with it in the right way, controlling our anger, no matter who is watching. It says, keep in mind that our ultimate goal is to control our anger so that it does not ca cause harm to ourselves or others. And this is a point we want to emphasize. 
The next and equally important goal is to teach our children how to control their anger so that it does not lead to harmful, resentful behaviors. And we've learned how, you know, uncontrolled anger can turn to rage and become very deadly. And we don't ever want it to get to that point. We want to be able to have that self-control and to be able to calm ourselves down before it gets to something that can be very dangerous. And another important point to keep in mind is, you know, as we're going through this, we're going to make mistakes, but we have to admit when we make those mistakes. And even if it's in front of our children or our students, you know, letting them know when you made a mistake, everyone makes mistakes, it's okay, but we can learn from them. And, you know, once you know what they are, concentrate on fixing the problem so that it doesn't occur again. Turning over to page 54, page 54, and you're going to highlight the heading, General Tips for Teaching Anger Management Skills. If someone were to ever ask you for some tips on how to manage your anger, these are the tips you would want to present to them. And it's important to present all of them to them. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to leave any out because in order for them to be effective and work properly, they need to have all of the tips. So the first one, we're, we're going to go over them real quick. The first one is keep your cool. You are the authority and the mature adult who should model how to handle every situation in a positive moral way. Stay calm and in control. Bend down to a young child's level and maintain eye contact when instructing a child that has lost his self-control. The second one here is be patient. Okay, this is another really big positive character trait. Every parent needs a big dose of the positive character trait of patience because no lesson is taught just once. If you've ever worked with children, you know that. It takes repetition. Children learn through repetition, so expect to patiently teach and reteach. And whenever you do this, it not only helps it stick in the child's mind, but it also is helping it stick in your mind better by going over it again and again. Point number three, take the time to teach as well as correct. Many parents are quick to correct, but we can also use a child's misbehavior as a teaching tool. Look for opportunities to explain to your child why something is wrong, the consequences of their wrong choice, and the benefits of making a right choice. And, you know, if you don't tell a child that a certain behavior is wrong, how will they know? They have to be taught. So you, we don't want to just jump on them and correct them. We want to make sure that we're teaching them as well and letting them know this is a wrong behavior and why it's a wrong behavior. And, you know, help, help show them that so that they, they don't do it again. Number four, use active listening. Active listening is a powerful tool that helps children talk out rather than act out. Active listening hears not only the words that are being said, but also the intent or true feelings behind the words. Active listening also conveys concern, love, and acceptance. Number five, don't expect perfect results right away. Give your child the guidance of what is expected and then allow him an opportunity to correct his behavior. So we have to give them, we have to give them room to grow and to be able to show us, you know, what they've learned from what we've taught them. Keep your expectations age appropriate as well. Number six, talk to your child about his or her behavior and how you plan to help him demonstrate proper conduct. Don't try to explain a new behavior plan when your child is out of control. The time to do it is before the child's next outburst when he is calm. The child's ability to listen and comprehend will be seriously compromised if he is upset and out of control. When you talk with him, tell him in a loving tone that you are concerned about his behavior because kicking, hitting, name calling, or throwing things, even when he is angry, is wrong and unacceptable. Let your child know that you want him to behave appropriately even when he is angry. So you're giving them a better 
a better alternative. You're giving them an alternative to the situation. They don't have to act out on their emotions. They can, you know, everyone will feel anger at certain times, but we can control it. On page 56, we have point number seven, institute calm down time. This is a very effective way to help a child regain his or her self-control. The calm down time for children should mirror adults time who before a fit of anger stops to count to 10 in order to calm down. When directing a child into calm down time, bend down to the child's level and maintain eye contact. Speak in a firm, a firm low tone of voice. Do not yell or scream. You can physically put the child into the designated calm down area gently, but firmly, if she will not walk there on her own. If the child comes out before you see a change in behavior, simply put the child back. Okay, and all of this is done with the authority figure practicing self-control. It doesn't work if you as the authority have lost your self-control and are acting out on your emotions. It will not be effective. Calm down time can vary depending on the situation or age of the child. When he shows that he has regained his composure, talk with him about his behavior. And then this next sentence here, it says, use the calm down, use the child's calm down time to calm yourself down as well. Remember to handle the situation appropriately by maintaining your composure. Okay, number eight, remember to use rules and reward system. If your child's behavior is problematic, with two to three episodes of throwing a tantrum, hitting or kicking in one day, develop rules and reward system to target those specific behaviors or add a rule that concerns anger management to an existing reward system. Number nine, process the experience. If you must utilize the calm down time, be sure to talk to your child once he has regained composure. Ask the child to process his behavior and the consequences of his actions. Use a firm tone of voice and maintain eye contact while you are speaking. Be sure, the be sure to ask the child why he was given calm down time. Ask him which rule he broke and what he will do the next time. Lastly, be sure he apologizes for his behavior. Okay, and then on page 57, we have the last point here. Be creative when giving out consequences. Not every misbehavior deserves the same consequence. Stop and think about what consequences can best teach the child. Okay, so that concludes those points. And this is actually the end of lesson seven. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to the next teacher to continue with lesson eight. Welcome again to the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program. It's always an honor to sit be to, before um, such wonderful people who are striving to put this into their lives, and that's what it's all about. And Sarah um, left off with number 10 on, verse, on page 70, uh, 57 about those 11 um, tips for teaching anger management. Remember, anger is just a secondary emotion. Always remind yourself this. So if your child is having issues and becoming angry, as an adult, you want to have your, your parents know that. Try to figure out why they're angry. What, did they get disappointed? Are they frustrated? You know, to look at those things, not just look at it as they're being angry, because there's always a reason behind that. So number 11, the 11th tip on page 58 is to be consistent. And I know Sarah went over this really well. I mean, she just, as she was going through her pages that she was going over, that word came up often with her. So this is the importance of this tip, is to, um, this is like the glue that holds all positive parenting together. Because if you're not consistent, your child's not gonna believe you really believe in what you're telling them. We must be consistent. Uh, never let inappropriate 
inappropriate behavior slide. You know, you're tired. Oh, I'll, I'll just let it go this time. No, because it's going to be that much harder to really get that child to understand that it's important to you. If you let it go, um, they're not going to believe. You're just, they're just not going to believe you believe in what you're telling them. Many of the previous tips are applicable for children of all ages. Generally speaking, children should be beyond the stage of throwing tantrums by the age of six. The, with the Peaceful Solution, we see children never throwing a tantrum. I know that might seem impossible for someone that might just be coming into knowing this program, but give this program the opportunity that it has for us and you will see that this is more than possible. It's shown over and over again that the, these tips, this whole program works. Okay, so without self-control and anger management skills, we justify the poor ways we handle anger. And that's not a great thing to do. Often blame it in on people and circumstances in our lives. And at times we seek to take revenge. And those are things we want to eliminate in our lives. And as we eliminate them in our lives, like Sarah said, the best time to teach this is in the child's womb. Well, the best time to prepare for it, to teach it in the child's womb, is before that child even gets into the womb so that you know that this is the program that's, that you want to have that foundation to build your child upon. Uh, like last night, we had a teacher speaking, and she used the word, it would be our moral compass. And I just love that. I mean, I know I, I have poor direction. I, I don't have a sense of direction. Honestly, I don't. But when I look at those words comparing to a program, I do have direction in this program of how to live my life. And that's what we want to teach our children, that this is where our foundation, our feet stand upon when we make decisions. Let's turn over to page 61. Lesson 8, Teaching Children About Respect. Paragraph 1, respect is like uh, an investment. And when you show honor and esteem to others, you get positive results. When you start a business, you don't have money rolling in the first day. It takes time. Just as respect is an investment, you might not see it that first day you use it, but it takes self-control to learn to respect someone. So paragraph one, another important positive character trait that every parent must have is respect. And here's the definition for respect. To show honor, esteem, care, and concern for others, property, the environment, ourselves, and all life. Like self-control, respect is a pillar of positive moral character and is therefore vital. That, that word vital means it's necessary. It's necessary. You can't do without it to life of each individual and to our society as a whole. And you saw down there, you want to, in that little bracket like there, that's where it says respect is like an investment. You get so much more out than you put in, so you might want to highlight that. Let's turn to page 63. And under the heading, it starts with you. No, it starts with me too. It starts with all of us. But that's what it says there. It starts with you. If we take a closer look at respect and how it applies to individuals, our community, and even our nation, we see that respect can be divided into four main categories. OK, so we're going to go over those four main categories. Self-respect. If you don't have self-respect and self-value for yourself, you're not going to have it for anyone else. Respect for others, respect for possessions, yours and others, and respect for the environment. So you want to make sure those are highlighted there. And let's turn over to page 64. What's your respect IQ? We need to look at this section carefully. And if a parent beats a child down with disrespect, Will that child learn self-respect? No. 
that's what's so amazing about this, this program. I was talking to a woman today about this program and because she was troubled by the way our society is going, especially the teenagers, she said. I said, here at The Peaceful Solution, we teach. We just keep teaching. And so I said, we don't just tell them. Everybody can recognize the problem. I said, but we teach them. And we teach until they understand. And how do we know that they understand it? Because they don't memorize just the words, the concepts. They actually become a living testimony of these words in their lives. And so that's when we know that we fully reach the heart and the mind of that child. When we see changes make, being made where they start respecting themselves, respecting each other, respecting the environment. So uh, that's what the Peaceful Solution does to anyone that uses this program. Like Sarah said, you have to use it. You got to pick it up and actually start using it. Okay, so then um, you cannot have respect a child, you cannot have a child respect the parent if the child doesn't know how to respect themselves. So that's where a parent has to, and you teach your, your parents, you have to work on yourself so that they not only hear the right words, but they see the right actions. They have to see the right actions. So you, you want to go down, and, and that you, they always have a scenario, and then you could ask yourself, where you fall in there. And that everyone does on an individual basis. Like the first one says, I teach my child to accept people from different cultures. Well, are you gonna say always, sometimes, never? And then after you, if, if you have a lot of sometimes nevers in the, in the wrong places here, after you've been taking this course and learning the peaceful solution, you'll find that you'll go back and take this test and everything shifts. Everything is so different. And that's because you've been taught until someone helped you to understand. So let's go over to page 67. Positive goals help build self-respect. We learned about the importance of having purpose in life and setting goals in the acceptance unit. And that's in chapters five and six. And then also, you can't just teach this with words once again. It has to be in your actions. That's, that's all it is, it's all in your actions. So just remember this page, positive goals help build self-respect. And that's where everyone has to start setting their goals. And it says here, um, toward the end of that um, paragraph, first paragraph, it says, a goal is an end that you strive to attain. Sometimes we don't know how to set goals, and sometimes children don't know how to set goals. So then you teach them how to set a goal, and then you show them what they have to do to get there. And then they'll start valuing that effort that they're making because they're going to strive harder to reach a goal, no matter what it is. They're going to strive to attain it. And then you're, they're going to start setting their own goals after you keep telling them over and over, showing them how to set mini goals. And then they're going to start setting their own goals as they continue growing up. Remember, goals aren't just um, for attaining something material in your hand. A goal is becoming a better person, saying I'm going to treat that person with respect. I'm, no matter what, I'm not going to be disrespectful to someone. And yes, you might fall and you might fall short, but you know what? We get back up. Falling doesn't mean you stay down. It means you get back up. It's another opportunity to better yourself. Let's turn over to page 68. It says a heading, a few tips for teaching respect Let's highlight the first two sentences there, where it says, children are like sponges. They soak up the values of those around them. And a value is what you redeem as important. Now, they can either pick up a value that's not a right value, but they'll still pick it up. That's why it's important that we show the values that we have 
If a parent deems heroin important, a child will pick this up. If a parent values studying instead of turning on the TV, the child will be likely to learn, likely learn to value it also. Really, the TV is like a, um, if it's used as a babysitter, it's, if it's used just so that you have time away from your child and you want them to be mesmerized by it, it will work. You can do that. But you're going to find out that they're, um, you're, you're allowing influences in their lives that you're going to regret later. Uh, I was, um, it was, it was very taught to me when I started having my children that how bad the TV was. And so for the first 10 years, um, we had no TV in our house. I'm telling you, it was made a big difference. It made a lot of communication. You had to do a lot of hands-on, a lot of interaction with your children. And you really learned to become a family. You really learned to see the importance of one another. And I, I think that um, to challenge you to turn the TV off and turn on your listening to your children and you will reap such great benefits. It will be just so amazing. That, that's a challenge, personally, I put out to you, is to just turn the TV off and give your child that, that time. So let's turn over to page 71. And that's lesson nine, teaching children responsibility. Okay, we were taught in the other Peaceful Solution books that responsibility is not something you are born with. If you want a child to be responsible, you need to teach them to be responsible. A parent has to be responsible first. And that's why if you, before you even start a family, you learn, learn these uh, steps to success through the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program, and you'll be really set for when that child does start growing in your womb. But don't think that you've gone too far and you've, you have five children along the line and you didn't start learning on this fast enough. It's okay. We all, uh, most of us didn't do that. Most of us it was a process of learning of many mistakes of the years before we learned the peaceful solution. But what's really pretty amazing is then you can really see how the peaceful solution can change a heart and a mind that had been going in the wrong direction and not having care and concern and not have respect and responsibility. And then you can see a whole life change and it's like, it's like, um, it's like almost like a miracle. It's like you, you knew someone and it's like, and then you see them later and they're, they're so different. And it's like the first thing you'll hear people say is, what are you doing? What, what, what's changed in your life? And it's all character education. So on a highlight under um, what is, um, no, responsibility, what is it? The first paragraph highlight that just like any other positive character trait responsibility must be developed over time being responsible means you are so, are someone you are someone others can count on to fulfill their duties and obligations but most of all you can count on yourself to make choices that are positive and supportive of your moral character development. Yes, you will start examining yourself and you'll start seeing that you want to change. So you're gonna start you know, seeing the changes and working toward them. Now, doesn't that sound like something you want to instill in your children? That's something we want instilled everywhere. Okay, and under teaching responsibility on that same page, uh, underline that first sentence, build the positive character trait of responsibility by establishing and maintaining routine in your child's life. Routine is very important. It, it's a stability for a child. If they know they're, they're going to get up at a certain time, and that they're going to be fed at a certain time, they, that brings a stable life in, in a child's mind. And then from that stability, they can grow into what they want. You know, if you 
uh, if you ever planted a plant and you put it in the ground and you didn't like push it down firmly so it's like sort of like just jiggling around in there loose it's hard for that plant to grasp on until something is fixed but when you put that plant down in the ground and you pat it down really firmly and you water it real well and you pat it down again so all that air is out of there that plant will take off fast. That's the stability of having a routine for your child, getting them that solid so they know there's not gonna be major shifts unless, you know, you, ha you always have um, emergencies that might come up and okay, we didn't get to bed at this certain time because why? Oh, you cut your finger and we had to take you to get taken care of? Well, yes, you're going to do that. You're going to let the child know that, you know, if there are emergencies where the routine might be disrupted, but we're going to get back onto it as soon as we can. We're not going to just, okay, we, we just can't do it anymore because that one night we didn't do it. We're going to focus on the, the positive things, the endurance that we have in this program. Let's turn over to page 73. Under the heading, what does work ethic mean? Now we know that um, parents might have a different uh, way of looking at this than our children because you know we have goals, we keep at our jobs because we want to make sure that we can provide for our family, make sure that we can put food on the table, make sure that we can clothe them. Um, a child, you know, they have a job but they sometimes grow a little tired of, of doing that job and you have to remind them the importance of it. So don't let the word work scare you. It is an essential part of everyday life. And that's why you teach them not only what their job is, but the value that that job has in the overall part of your family. Make sure that you instill that into your parents that every person doing their part in the family helps that family function better. So and let them know that every part is important. You know, you have your little two-year-old that can take the, some of the dishes over to the table to help set the table. That was very important. Or you wanna give them the, the forks and the spoons to put on the table, let them do that. Don't, don't do those things for your child. Let your child feel the importance of being a part of a family. I've seen families, you know, before they came to the Peaceful Solution, the mother did everything. And I was like, wow, I, I didn't grow up that way. We all had our part and it, it made you feel valuable. So don't do all the work. Share it with your children and share it joyfully. Sometimes um, you have to make it joyful for them because they don't really see it. So sometimes I would, um, okay, we put all the little jobs that they had on a piece of paper and I'd roll them up and we'd put them in a bag and that would say, okay, whatever you pick, that's your job for this week. And so they would pick, but if it was one of the little ones got something that was like a little too advanced for them, I would let them know that I would be there to assist them, but not do it all for them. I would assist in helping them. And I'm telling you, they were so joyful with that that um, I, it wasn't like someone else was telling them that they knew that whatever opportunity they had to whatever they picked out, that was their job to be a part of this great family that we were, we were all working toward. Page 75, assigning chores. And this is where I said, you know, you can make your charts, but let's look at, um, highlight this first paragraph, please. Assigning chores should be a common practice within the family unit. Everyone should have appropriately assigned jobs they must do to contribute to the maintenance of the home. Remember, though, that just because it's not anyone's particular job to do something, like pick up the scrap paper from the floor, everyone has a responsibility to pick it up when they see it. When it comes to giving our children chores to do, use these basic guidelines, guidelines to help bring success. And uh, I think that's very important to let them know that, okay, if you see a little problem, don't wait and think that someone else is gonna take care of it. See if you're gonna be the bigger person and to fix that little problem, pick that little piece of trash up. And then when you see your child do it, 
you're going to just do flips for them because you're going to let them know, like, I saw you do that. And no one even had to tell you to do that. And you picked it up, and then you took it to the trash, and you didn't even care if someone came and said, great job. You're going to let them know that I saw you do that great thing. And let them know, because you know what? The more they hear that from you, guess what? The more they're going to want to do it. Instead of, why didn't you pick that piece of paper up? No. If they walk past it, go over there and say, oh, look, I found that piece of paper on the floor. I'm going to go throw it in the trash. And then they're going to say, boy, why didn't I do that? Mom got to do that. Or big sister got to do that. And they'll think they'll want to do it too. So you don't have to like nag at them, just keep teaching and keep setting that great example in front of them. So let's go over to page 76. A few more thoughts on responsibility. Do I think responsibility is an important thing in children's lives, in parents' lives, in adults' lives, in everyone's lives? I do. I mean, that was instilled strongly in me as a child. And um, so that's why it is even, I mean, it's, it was never explained like this, the way the peaceful solution is. But it was taught. It was taught to us. Once a child is, once a job is once begun, never leave it till it's done. Great or small, do it well or not at all. That's something I was taught in se between first and second grade by a little piece of paper that my mother cut out of the newspaper and she put it on the wall and she'd have me read it. And I read it and read it and guess what? I still remember it today and that was like a while ago. A few more thoughts on responsibility. Okay, let's um, highlight the paragraph below that and um, we're gonna go over A and B there. As a parent, you have a responsibility to spend quality time with your children. And let me tell you, um, even making individual time for your children, you know you have 10 children, sometimes it seems a little stressful to be able to get a little time for each of those children, but you can. If it's your goal, you can make a little time for each one. Keep in mind that positive moral character is not developed overnight. Remember, it's to keep on trying to get up, be consistent. As you strive to eliminate negative character traits from your own life, talking to your parents that you're teaching, remember to be patient and determined to improve yourself for the benefit of your children. It says here again, along with teaching them through your example, and positive role model, remember to develop a rapport of friendship with your children. Now, I think this is also very important to laugh with your children and to let them know that you enjoy being with them. Now, it doesn't mean to bring yourself down to their level. They'll still know that you're their, their mother or your parent, but you're going to allow them to enjoy themselves with you. And, and the more that you can do that, the more they're going to want to come to you, the more that when they're struggling with something, they will trust you because they know that you really feel that they, they'll feel that they're important to you. And once they, that you get them to where they really feel they're important to you, then that trust and that confidence they have in you will, will will be a safe haven for them so that when storms come, you know they're going to come to you. So it says here, of course, you will not be able to keep every worksheet they do or everything. But Bill, let's um, highlight this here um, paragraph, the one that's right under A, A and B, those, that, those two A and B says, building a friendship with our children should never devalue our roles as effective parents. I've seen that where the parent tries to become a teenager to think that they're going to be able to relate. A teenager doesn't need another teenager to teach them. A teenager wants their parents to teach them. So yes, you can enjoy them, but don't try to be like them. 
Rather, it should accentuate it. We want our children to be comfortable talking to us, to trust us, and um, to turn to us when they, are, they have doubts or questions. And then it has a few ways there that you can build a friendship with your children. Let's turn over to page 79. This is lesson 10. Rewards and consequences really do work. Mini test right now. What pages did um, Sarah tell us to remember? 25 and 40. 25 had the role of the parent, the teacher, the disciplinarian, and the provider. And what did 40 have? The STOP acronym, yes. So 25, the role of a parent, and 40, the STOP acronym. I'm glad you were so listening to her. She's such a great teacher. I said, I think I, uh, when I develop perfectly within the Peaceful Solution, I'm going to be a great teacher like Sarah. Lesson 10, rewards and con consequences really do work. OK, we're on page 79. You're going to highlight the following. It's in, up in the first um, paragraph. It says, in cases like this, you might want to consider a simple reward system to focus on specific problematic behaviors. So it's specific, though. It's not for every little thing that they do. But if they're having trouble in a certain area, you want to help them by trying to keep, uh, Give them a reward system. So on page 81, let's turn over there. It says pointers for formulating a rewards chart. Now there are specific pointers given for formulating that reward chart. And it's right down here. We'll quickly go over. Be clear about what behaviors you expect. The next one, choose no more than four. Uh, sometimes people like me, you want to just start out with one and focus on that. And then the next one is choose a reward that's applicable. You know, you're not going to think that your 16-year-old is going to think you're going to get by just with a sticker. No, but a sticker to a two-year-old is pretty like, wow. So you're going to make it something that they're really going to want to strive for. Give the reward only after your child demonstrates the behavior. Consequences are as important as rewards. OK, let's turn over to page 82. Just that first sentence under be consistent, one of the most important aspects of teaching children self-control with the simple method of implementing rules is to be consistent over and over again. Don't slack off. Don't ever slack off. It's too important to you and your child to not slack off. OK, so lesson 11 is a special note about young adults. OK, and we're, I think we're going to have to pick up on that one next time. I see that our time has run out. but. I